All right. Welcome, Kim. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> You're welcome. And so we're talking today about the, the gut-brain connection and the uh, microbiome. And you have an interesting story about how you got into to focusing on uh, gut health and the microbiome as a naturopathic doctor. Yeah, I have to say it was not in my plans and I've been practicing for a long time now. Um, so when we go back to when I was in school, we didn't talk about the microbiota because it wasn't really a thing. Um, I come from a germ model. So we learned what bacteria causes what disease and how do we kill it? Um, and that maybe as a naturopath, we wanted to look at natural options if they were an option instead of an antibiotic, but it still was, how do we kill it? Um, I remember when I graduated, one of the biggest areas that they were looking at was the idea of how, um, how can we kill the one thing that is causing inflammatory bowel disease, so Crohn's and colitis. Mm -hmm. So if we can find that and then we can kill it, then we will cure Crohn's and colitis. And as we know, now that it's almost 20 years later, there's not a disease bacteria that causes inflammatory bowel disease. So they were kind of in the right area, but but this one bacteria causes one disease model that I learned about just, just doesn't really work with what we understand. Mm -hmm. But because I'm a naturopath, we did understand a little bit about good bacteria. So we had like a, a lecture on probiotics. Um, still, we knew very little at that time. So it was like a post-it note lecture that was mm -hmm. if someone has taken an antibiotic, give them a probiotic because it's magical unicorn good. Uh, we didn't really know very much about that, but we did know that there was stuff going on. Um, if someone takes an antibiotic, they're probably at higher risk to have gut disorders, or maybe you're a female taking it for strep throat, and then a few weeks later, you get a vaginal yeast infection. Mm -hmm. We know stuff was happening, but that was kind of the extent of it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. then... Oddly enough, in 2009, um, I got an email from a pharmaceutical company asking me to be on their advisory board. And I remember getting the email and first thinking that it was one of my colleagues sending me a fake email because I could not imagine that a pharmaceutical company was contacting me. Um, so they're so, just testing you to see. Exactly. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> exactly. What is going on? Um, so then I realized that it was a real thing that was happening. Um, and, and then, quite honestly, I had to go through the process of, first, why on earth would a pharmaceutical company want to work with a naturopath? And secondly, can I, as a naturopath, work with a pharmaceutical company? Because obviously they are the devil. Um, so um, there, there was that whole process. Um, I was curious enough to meet with them. So what they had said was they were working in the microbiota, they had strain-specific probiotics, they worked with gastroenterologists, and they wanted to move into other areas of healthcare um, practitioners that also worked in those areas, which was a great answer for me. Um, so I felt very good about that. And I was actually talking to a friend of mine about whether I could work with them. And I remember him saying, you know, you could choose not to work with him or to work with them um, because you don't feel comfortable with that. And all the naturopaths could decide not to work with them because they're a pharmaceutical company. Are they going to stop working in the area of the microbiota mm -hmm. and probiotics and all the things that you do? Or are they going to hire people who don't have your education and values and ethics? Mm -hmm. and, and then what's going to happen? because they're probably going to stay in this area. And that's what made me decide to work with them. And it's one of the best experiences that I've had. Um, mm -hmm. That was the time when the microbiota, this idea that we have all these good and bad bacteria, totally exploded. So I was very, very lucky to get in at that point. But it was also something that they allowed me to do a ton of interprofessional work. So speaking to naturopaths, but also other healthcare providers um, and, and seeing how we could do this really well together. Mm. So that's the time when the microbiota kind of blew up. So do you think it's appropriate to sort of talk about what that is right now? Yeah, this is, it's so interesting too. And it's such an interesting uh, decision process. We're like, well, if, if I don't do it, who's, who are they going to hire instead? You know? 
Well, and that was actually funny because I remember looking at a new product that they were considering that wasn't microbiota based um, and it had parabens in it. And it was just something that was so simple for me as a naturopath to say, don't, don't go with that product. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas they never thought about that. So if it wasn't something that we're getting our education across and what's important mm -hmm. to what we do, there may be a lot of things that are out there that aren't great for the consumer. So, so it really was a great experience. Mm -hmm. um, but around 2009 was when we really started to have changes in our understanding of bacteria. So we went from that germ model where we were looking for what were the bad bacteria or what was the virus that was causing something or the yeast that was causing something. And the main way that we figured that out was culturing. So they would take a stool sample or a nasal sample and thank you to the lab techs who are the people who do these things. Um, and people will often know those petri dishes, those little red dishes that they have the little swabby thing on there and you see what grows and you get that little white bloom on there or whatever. So they grow what they can find and then they study those bacteria. But inherently to be able to look at those bacteria, they have to be able to survive in oxygen. So around 2009, they started to come up with new techniques that they could look at bacteria through their DNA. Um, and that meant that the bacteria didn't have to be alive. And at that moment, there was this explosion in the number and types of bacteria. So it was literally a holy crap moment. We have been missing on everything. Literally so a holy crap moment. I know, I know. <laughs> I'm so good with that. You're like, you jokes. <laughs> Glad you didn't miss it. Yeah. <laughs> this is what I do all the time with my patients. Thankfully, they generally find it funny. Otherwise, I tend to straight face it and keep going. But it's reasonably good. So yes, thank you for getting my joke. Um, <laughs> audience of one right now. crap right now. Yeah. <laughs> So the number's constantly changing, and it's totally a made-up number, but right now the estimates are we have about 40 trillion bacterial cells that live in and on us. Mm -hmm. Technically, that means cell for cell, we are more bacteria than we are human. So thankfully, our human cells are bigger than the tiny, tiny, tiny bacterial cells, so we look like our super cute cells. Otherwise, it would be way creepier, um, <laughs> but there's a lot of them. And that's a handy party fact for people who like facts about bacteria at parties, which obviously all of us do. Um, but it's way more than that because those bacteria are constantly doing and making things that change how we function as human beings. So when we talk about that concept of good and bad bacteria, good bacteria simply means that when they eat the stuff that they eat and ferment it to turn it into gases and chemicals, those gases and chemicals are going to do good things for our health. Mm. And bad bacteria, they are going to be making chemicals that as the net overall effect are going to do negative things. Mm. So a lot of the time, because most of the bacteria in the gut are, uh, or most of the bacteria in our body are in the gut, we tended to originally think about them mainly as gut effects. And there are a lot of them. So they can affect transit time. So how quickly um, our stool is moving in and out of us. So hopefully it's sort of a normal pace. Um, like what, 50 one hours? Two, or? Yeah, one yeah. to two bowel movements a day sort of thing is great. For some people it may be longer than that, but we don't want to have constipation and diarrhea. If we have a lot no. of bad bacteria, no, we don't. <laughs> we can see we get more gas production that happens, or we can see some of the negative effects can be inflammation or pain, or I don't love the term, but leaky gut syndrome where we get damage to the intestinal um, barrier that we have, um, or these sorts of things that would be related to damage in the digestive tract. But what we've been learning more and more about is these chemicals that are produced by the bacteria affect us systemically. Um, and that's where we're seeing that they can make chemicals that are related to what we would normally think with brain function. Um, or they can produce chemicals that promote or... Um, um, help us have anti-cancer effects. So we can see that. We can see that they can be related to um, blood glucose control or glucose intolerance or hormone changes in the body. So they seem to be affecting almost all areas of health because they can do things that are very broad, like inflammation or immune modulation or um, that gut brain health or hormonal effects that are well beyond just that gut side of things. So they're a big part of what is going on within us. 
And maybe, yeah, maybe we're just meat suits for the bacteria. Yeah, absolutely. We are <laughs> definitely a carrier for their world domination plan, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, and they've even hijacked now, yeah, pharmaceuticals, mm -hmm. right? Like they run the pharmaceutical industry and they're, yeah, in the For process. sure. This is what is happening. They are winning at this war on things. Because they're, the they're not dying out. We're, <laughs> we're the <laughs> ones who are having more of the issues that are going on. Yeah. But it's interesting because these are single-celled organisms. So we are one, I'm one person mm -hmm. who is hosting 40 trillion organisms. Um, and they're constantly turning over. So there's always the possibility to change within them. Um, so their balance can change and that can affect our health. So I can't affect the age of me, even though I'm turning over with my own cells as a human being, I'm still a 46 year old single cell, not single celled, single organism. Mm -hmm. um, but these are constantly changing. So that's a huge area that we can affect change in our health throughout our entire lives, which is a very interesting way mm -hmm. of looking at health. And this whole concept of the microbiota has been a massive paradigm shift in how we understand health right now, because it's not simply about my human cells. Food is not just for my muscles or my heart, it's also for these bacterial cells. Mm -hmm. um, the food or the water that I drink or the way that I sleep or how stress affects me not only affects my human cells, it affects those cells of our microbiota as well. And if we don't look at that, then we're missing half of, of how we consider the human body. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting. And I'm curious about with the germ model and before 2009, when this explosion happened, when they could start to essentially um, examine the microbiome, which is mm -hmm. about the DNA, right? It's yes. not about the, the actual cells um, necessarily. Yeah. What did they think? Like, they, they just didn't know the extent to how many. Right. Yeah. So we knew that there were good and bad cells and we had some concept around it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, I always find it interesting because one of the, um, most prominent um, bacterial cell that we find in healthy individuals in North America is called F. prosnitzi. Um, mm -hmm. We didn't know about that while I was in school. It just, it wasn't even named as a thing. Mm -hmm. And now we're realizing that we want to have a lot of it. It produces these chemicals that are anti-inflammatory and help us with immune modulation. And um, they, they act as something called a histone deacetylase inhibitor, which mm -hmm. helps around brain function. Mm -hmm. um, so it can do all of these things and we didn't know it existed. Mm -hmm. um, so it's this crazy scenario that we knew it was kind of important. Um, but it's actually the whole, with all the, the things that have been happening within this area, I remember really early on, I, I love reading Medscape articles where they just summarize research. Oh, yeah. So it helps me decide whether I want to actually read the research paper or not. Um, yeah, <laughs> exactly. But one of the more fascinating parts for me as well is to look at the comments that are coming from other healthcare providers. And Medscape is not a naturopathic thing at all. Um, so usually it's going to be MDs who are, are writing. Um, so I remember, again, probably a decade ago, I saw this study about the gut microbiota and anxiety. Um, and it was one of these things that just made me so fascinated um, in the whole area. But what they did was they had... Um, individuals with anxiety and individuals who didn't have anxiety. And they took their gut microbiota and they transferred them into what we call germ-free mice. Mm. Um, so these are mice that are bred to not have any bacteria in them. So now they're taking on what the humans had. So they would take them and they had these the way that I envision it, they call it a cross study, but it's like scaffolding that's above the ground um, mm. that the mice can run on. So it's not like a tightrope, um, but it's also not like a giant sidewalk either. And they have, part of it is glassed in or walled in, and the other arm of it is open to the air. And what they saw was the mice who got the bacteria from people with anxiety would only stay in the walled in areas. So where they were safe, and the, the mice that got the bacteria from people who didn't have anxiety would run on the whole structure. Um, so they were less nervous and cautious when they got that. Mm -hmm. And so I, first of all, I just found the study fascinating, but I had already bought into the idea of the microbiota. 
But I also found the comments fascinating because there were so many comments saying, it is absolutely not possible no. that the gut bacteria are affecting mental health. Like yeah. this is the stupidest thing that I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and now we're at the point where hundreds of studies are generally coming out every year on this. And it's more of a set fact that this gut brain connection and the microbiota affecting what is happening with our mental health or neuropsychiatric disorders. That's a fact that we understand at this point, but that's a fairly short period of time that we've gone from here to there. It doesn't mean that everyone has caught up with that science necessarily. And also, unfortunately, it doesn't mean that all of the science is usable at this point. So we don't know what is the right gut microbiota to have really great mental health. We have ideas around it and how to get there, but we don't know what that looks like. And even if we knew what it looks like, we don't know how to make that in someone at this point. Yeah, like we don't know that secret sauce. That right. The yeah. Have. We don't have a recipe book mm -hmm. that says, add this, then that stir it up and now you have great mental health. We're not quite there, but we do have at least some ideas of what's not right and how to start moving in a more positive direction. Mm -hmm. and so, yeah, and it's almost like the mouse that's more cautious is the bacteria that was transplanted into that mouse or, this, or the strains that were creating, were coming together to create that behavior. Was that somehow protecting the mouse or the anxious person? Like, do we culture those bacteria within us to protect ourselves from dangerous circumstances where we need to stay in our little shelters or, you know. Absolutely. And we certainly do have some evolutionary tendencies towards that direction. But we also know that humans right now, um, anxiety, I think, is diagnosed in one in three individuals. Right. Um, I think that's higher than depression rates are. Yeah. Um, I think we don't have as many good medications for it, so we don't have as many of the U.S. commercials on. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, now no one's on, like exactly having benzos. Yeah. yeah we don't. Yeah. All the good ones make <laughs> you addicted and sleep all the time, and you can't use heavy machinery. So that kind of rules that out. Um, all the good fun ones, but. <laughs> Everything that works also prevents you from working with machines and <laughs> doing anything else. So. Staying awake during the daytime, all the useful things. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so we don't, we don't see as much around anxiety, but um, I, I mean, I deal with gut health mm -hmm. consistently and I, I, pro I would say that I see anxiety associated with it more than depression, mm -hmm. although they're often combined together, but I see a huge amount of anxiety. So we know that anxiety rates are going up. Um, we know that gut dysbiosis um, is going up, so that imbalance between the good and the bad. And, and even things, and I think there's a lot of things that we know are going wrong, but one of the ones that I find really interesting is we see that a certain type of bacteria um, bifidobacteria, although there's some other ones, it tends to go down in individuals, well, in general with dysbiosis, but especially we see it in individuals with IBS or irritable bowel syndrome. Mm -hmm. And those types of bacteria commonly make something called GABA. Mm -hmm. And GABA is one of these neurotransmitters or brain chemicals that is related to anxiety. So if we don't have enough GABA, we tend to get this overfiring of our brain cells that can be related to anxiety or what I call monkey mind where we just things are going on or the what if scenarios what if I never find a guy and then I'm alone for the rest of my life and then I end up being eaten by a German shepherd and no one finds me for five days um, that sort of thing mm -hmm. um, so yeah. we see that, that's not exactly what they talk about in the studies but that's <laughs> what gets translated to in the people standing in my office um, so that's what we think about with GABA um, so if we're not making as much GABA as we should should necessarily and we have that gut brain connection and that vagus nerve um, that is the sort of nerve that connects or one of the the main nerves that connects our gut and our brain but also is involved in the connection between the gut microbiota and our brain we can see that that idea that individuals with IBS have more mental health challenges or more sleep challenges, we can see concrete reasons why that could be happening beyond the fact that IBS in itself is just stressful and probably anxiety or mood lowering um, for those individuals.
Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. Right. Yeah. And so when we're thinking about supplementing with GABA or even a benzo, the, the fun drugs we were talking about before, which tend yes. to act on GABA receptors, mm -hmm. this, this discrepancy that someone with anxiety may be suffering from low GABA could be coming from the microbiome, this deficiency in bifidobacteria. Absolutely. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's very, again, we're still working and it's very hard to prove anything in this area because we're talking about 40 trillion bacterial cells that are happening. And, right. um, but we are seeing these patterns and these trends and, and that's really important that we're understanding what's happening that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you, we think, I mean, I mean, there's, there's a lot of thought, right. That anxiety because a lot of people have IBS. And so the thought mm -hmm. is, well, if you're nervous, it affects your digestion, affects your gut health. But at least what the mouse study that you reference shows us is that there can be this, there, there definitely is other way ship where it goes the other way. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In my mind and everything that I see in the research, it's bi-directional. There's mm -hmm. no question about it. Um, and I think we know it. And that's one of the things that gut feeling that we get. Um, right. I know when I am anxious that I can feel it in my gut immediately. But also if I feel something going off in my gut, that can provoke anxiety. Um, but I always think about, um, I've done a couple triathlons, like really small ones, the baby versions of them, um, or races. Race washrooms are the most disgusting place in the entire world. Um, because everyone is anxious and nervous and like I remember going to one um, and I was meeting a friend in Grimsby and she was coming in from Oakville. So we were both traveling just a little bit to get there. And we got there and she's like, I have been to the washroom six times already this morning. <laughs> that's not typical. That's a gut brain connection thing that's going on. There is no question about it. Um, but then you're right. We see the other way as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the bifidobacteria, like we don't want to race. We're getting out of here. Like <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we're, we're gone. This is, this is not working for me at all <laughs> yeah. and then and then more anxiety manifests as this bi-directionality occurs and yeah. Yeah. well and it, there's so many connections to this um we know that individuals who do marathons or work out in really hot areas or not hot areas but um in hot environments so we, uh, we've seen military studies or um or things along those lines that that affects the gut bacteria as well and we can get damage that happens um so there's all these things that we just yeah they're single-celled organisms that's why they're killed so easily by the horrible sprays that we have a lot of the time um mm -hmm. and we have to keep that in mind that all of these chemicals and all the stresses that we have and, and things that may have not been normal historically can affect these organisms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you were, you were talking before um, about, so, you know, it's, it's really difficult to know exactly what to do, but we know yeah. what not to do. So maybe yes. let's talk about, <laughs> about the concrete things that one should not do if we care about our, our 40 trillion friends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know what? I think food is is the most concrete thing that we can do on a day-to-day -day basis to be friends with our microbiota. Mm -hmm. um, and it is something that, especially with me, like, I just am obsessed with this area, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something that I am constantly reading and looking at this stuff. And I've had great opportunities to speak to a lot of different researchers and ask the question of like, what do they do for their microbiota? And the answer always is eating the widest variety of plant foods possible. Mm -hmm. And it's something that, that even in the studies, if we're looking at cancer or severe inflammatory or autoimmune conditions, it doesn't mean that people have to be vegetarian or vegan. Um, but it means that whatever we're doing, we want to be thinking about the fact that we are not only feeding our own human cells, or we're not looking at it just as a, I need to lose weight, therefore I should take away X nutrient out of my diet or X food out of my diet. Um, because while Technically, I am under the belief that anyone can lose weight. Um, if anyone has ever watched Survivor, that will prove that fact. If you eventually eat a low enough amount of food and cal calories and they just make you do stuff all the time, they all lose weight. It, probably some of them have hypothyroidism or polycystic ovarian syndrome and they all lose weight. Mm -hmm. um, so that's not... 
Mm -hmm. It's not impossible to lose weight, even when it feels like you can't lose weight. Mm -hmm. Although most people are not going to use the survivor model of things. Yeah, but most say, can you lose weight and still be happy? Is exactly, yeah. and that's the thing. They are all yeah. miserable with skin wounds that are not healing, and they're all <laughs> crying all over the place. You're like, can you yeah, have the before a conversation and after pictures are without not crying? Exactly, exactly. yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, it's not great, but anyone can lose weight. Um, but to do, to be healthy, which I think is the bigger thing that we're talking about, um, we need to be feeding our own human cells and we need to be feeding our microbial friend cells. Um, and what we're seeing usually both in humans and in the microbial cells, but really specifically with the microbiota, um, they need specific foods. Hmm. our specific nutrients. And they're not the ones that we think about um, because we never cared about our microorganisms. Usually we wanted to kill them. So if we were thinking about killing them, we weren't thinking about what kind of snacks would they like today. <laughs> um, there are things like fructans and polyols and galactins and hmm. um, these subcomponents of food that nobody knows what they are, um, but they're found in a lot of our plant-based foods. So it's kind of weird to think about, um, but when I was in school, I learned about the fact, and you probably remember this as well, um, mm -hmm. but that in the small intestine, that's majorly where digestion absorption is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So 90, 90, 95% of our food is broken down and absorbed um, into the rest of our body. So I can use my amino acids to make a new muscle cell, or I can use zinc to help with my immune system or whatever it is. We can have these nutrients that are going to help my human body. And my thought, especially before I knew about this was, okay, well, how do I get that extra five to 10%? Should we juice the food? Should we make it into smoothies? Like, how are we going to get all these extra nutrients into my human cells? And then we realize that that extra five to 10% that isn't absorbed in the small intestine is the food for the bacteria. So this is one of these sort of magical unicorn things that somehow has come about, that we have a system to have food for the bacteria that we don't absorb into our body. So within foods like beans and apples and cauliflower and mushrooms and try to think, Oats, there are all these things that we as humans can't completely break down. Mm -hmm. And if we can't completely break them down, the molecules are too big, we can't absorb them into the body. There's no mechanism to get them in. So they stay inside the gut, which is where the bacteria live, and that's what they eat. And then thankfully, they don't go to the washroom the way we do. So they ferment it and they make these gases and chemicals. And we absorb so, the fermentation products. And Right. Yes. Yeah. We use those to do the things mm -hmm. um, that we want to do. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's how that works. Um, but a lot of times people, um, people will have an imbalance in their gut um, and when, when they eat those foods, those foods are feeding more of the bad bacteria and that can make them feel bad. So it makes it feel like those foods are a problem. Mm -hmm. um, like if I have too much cauliflower and that makes me bloated and gassy, therefore I shouldn't eat cauliflower. Mm -hmm. Where the problem actually isn't the cauliflower. Cauliflower is doing exactly what cauliflower is supposed to do. Your body's doing exactly what it's supposed to do and not absorbing all of the nutrients from cauliflower. But unfortunately, those nutrients are feeding the wrong bacteria. And what we need to be focused on is getting those good bacteria up higher so you're feeding the right stuff. So what we see is a lot of people who end up thinking that they are allergic and intolerant to a lot of foods and keep taking more and more foods away from their diet, um, as opposed to actually fixing some of the underlying issues and then eventually bringing more and more foods back. And I should highlight whenever I talk about food, I don't mean Doritos and McDonald's. If you don't <laughs> feel good eating those, I am not terribly sympathetic. And I say that as someone who really enjoys Doritos and they don't make me feel great after I eat them. It feels wonderful while I'm eating them and the little pleasure centers are going off in my head. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, which they've done a good job to make sure that I want to eat more and more of them. Um, 
But if I don't feel good after eating that, that's my own fault. <laughs> that's um, on me. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's on me. Yeah. But if you're not feeling good eating cauliflower and onions and apples and um, things along those lines, that's really an indication that your microbiota is out of balance. Mm-hmm. Now, if it is in balance, we want to be having foods that are high in fibers um, and Um, specifically, we have certain fibers called prebiotics. These are the fibers that feed the good bacteria uh, to do what we call conferring a health benefit. So that's just a vague way of saying doing something good in your body. So it might be anti-inflammatory effects. It might be allowing you to have more regular bowel movements. It does something good for you. Um, So prebiotics, I love oats. I think oats is one of the best prebiotic foods that we have. Um, We see it as helpful around things like diabetes and cholesterol levels, but it's actually really healing for the gut and it's feeding the good bacteria. Mm -hmm. Um, For me, I tend to eat savory oats because the only way I like it as a breakfast food is to basically add equal amounts of sugar to oats um, because oats is a really bland, ugh, grain Mm -hmm. by itself. Mm -hmm. Um, And I felt like that wasn't a great health strategy. So now I use it in place of rice or quinoa or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, I think quinoa is a great food. Rice, meh, it's Mm -hmm. kind of an empty food, but um, but oats just has that prebiotic effect that quinoa doesn't. Mm -hmm. Um, So I love to have it with other vegetables or eggs or taco seasoning or, um, yeah, Yeah. I love, love, love oats as a savory dish. The steel cut? The steel cut in place of rice? I do, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I get the Costco hard cooked seven minute steel cut oats yeah awesome. by the like the giant like awesome small in the t- instant pot and get her going yeah <laughs> well no you don't even have to it's seven <laughs> minutes on the stove it's brilliant <laughs> yeah it's faster than brown rice so you're, you're winning it's it. faster than brown rice so yes it is definitely a bonus in that i'm on a buckwheat kick these days oh, but th- yeah. yeah buckwheat's good um yeah. I'm trying to think. Yeah, definitely oats is my favorite grain. Mm -hmm. Um, Interestingly, for the program that I work with for my patients with Crohn's and colitis, um, the first and actually almost specifically only grain that's allowed for most of the program is oats, Mm -hmm. not even rice, which Mm -hmm. is sort of weird because people sort of think of oats as a hypoallergenic food, um, which is I think implying that most other things are allergenic, which Mm. we haven't seen that quinoa is allergenic and rice is allergenic, but like, Mm -hmm. anyways, um, but oats doesn't seem to irritate people, but it also provides a ton of benefit. And I think that's how we should be looking at food, not just what do I need to take away, but what is going to feed my body and my microbiota. Mm -hmm. We also see color is a really big deal. That's where we tend to get our antioxidants and polyphenol. So these are plant chemicals usually um, that again are going to kind of be like bonus added things. Um, But most of them aren't absorbed in the small intestine. So we actually think about 95% of them are not absorbed in the small intestine Mm -hmm. and they are biotransformed by the bacteria in the large colon. And then those metabolites again are absorbed. So if we don't have the right bacteria to do that, we may not as get get as much of the benefit from those nutrients, but that's our berries and dark chocolate and tea Mm -hmm. and apples and onions and Mm -hmm. um, black beans and all that sort of stuff. Like all that stuff. Yeah. Red wine (laughs) is on the list. Well, your red wine and dark chocolate may not be having the wanted effects. Exactly. Yes. (laughs) You probably have to do a lot of other stuff as well. Um, But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Those those are some of the, so food is definitely one of those things that I think we can have great control over. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think it's important as well for the parents to be thinking about what nutrition are they giving their kids and what nutrition are we giving to their gut microbiota? Because unfortunately what we're seeing is that generation over generation, we are having less diversity and richness of the bacteria because I think, we've been exposed to more antimicrobial medication um, in part with what we take as human beings. I'm actually super thankful that as a kid, I couldn't swallow any pills. Um, I don't think I learned until I was 28. Um, So that was super helpful. Also means I really don't take vitamins a lot of the time either. It definitely rules out fish oil capsules. Oh gosh. (laughs) You should see me taking a pill. I have to put it like 
have my hand in the back of my throat. So it like tips back like a sled down there. Um, I'm not good at this at all, even now. Um, but I also, if I ever had to take um, an antibiotic, they'd give that really thick, gross pink pe- penicillin thing. Mm-hmm. And I just vomited like a spoon with a measuring thing. Yeah, I just vomited it up all the time. It never got into me. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're seeing more antibiotics that way. We also know that there is way more antibiotics in our mass agriculture system. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't always, I don't buy in necessarily to the idea that all organics have higher nutrition in them, but that less antibiotic piece, and I think kindness to animals as well, and the ethical piece there um, mm-hmm. can be really important in the um, trying to think, I think it was a Pew Trust Institute um, out of the US did a study that was looking at the increase or the use of antibiotics in humans and in agriculture over 10 years. Um, And the, um, and I'm probably going to get the numbers wrong, but in humans over those 10 years, it's, I think it stated about 7.8 and I can't remember if it's million or billion pounds. I'm going to go with the lower number, but still a lot (laughs) million pounds of antibiotics. So it stayed pretty stable over 10 years. The use in agriculture went from 20 to almost 30 million or billion um, pounds over that time period. And that is, can be in the animals depending on when it's coming out. But more importantly, it gets into our groundwater. It gets into the manure that's being used in agriculture for um, other products. And we're seeing that this is getting into our soil and groundwater. Um, And that's something that's affecting us as humans. We're also exposed to chemicals a lot more than we were in the past. And those can affect our organisms. So we know that even though we don't absorb artificial sugars, um, that's the whole point of them is we don't absorb them. um, So we can't get that caloric effect from them. And they don't affect our insulin level directly the way that glucose would. Um, But as it turns out, it seems like the bacteria can metabolize them and we're getting negative effects from those as well. Um, That can still, even though we're not getting sugar, still increase insulin resistance and midsection weight gain in ways that we never realize through the bacteria um, or even the fact that chlorinated water um, or chloraminated water the whole point of chlorine is to kill microorganisms so all these little things that i always think about and i i'm dating myself whenever i say this but um, i used to love little house on the prairie with laura ingalls for all those who have no idea what i'm talking about she is a pioneer girl from pioneer times um, <laughs> but i always think about what would laura ingalls eat like what would have happened in laura ingalls world um, and all of the fake foods and the chemicals and the additives and preservatives Conservatives, um, we're seeing that those just aren't good for the single-celled organisms. And all the studies that are saying that this has been shown to be safe to this level within this tissue, um, mm-hmm. as much as they haven't been studied, the inter effects between all of these, and I still think that's an issue, we haven't looked at what happens with the single-celled organisms. And it's generally, when we are looking at it now, it's not good for the microbiota. It changes the diversity and richness. We tend to see more dysbiosis or imbalance going on. Mm -hmm. And then we run into the problem um, that we're generally getting negative health effects that are coming out of it as well. So Mm -hmm. um, food should be mainly real whole food that Laura Ingalls could have somehow made. So not really Doritos. Not yeah. really Doritos. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm having the Doritos on the tonight. Ferry or whatever. And Anna Green Gables just eating her Doritos. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet, spicy heat. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Follow it up with some chocolate covered almonds. Mm-hmm. Even though probably Laura Ingalls could make chocolate covered almonds if she mm-hmm. somehow was able to get chocolate. Right. It would require a rich kind though. Like, you know. It would be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's funny because everyone thinks that because I'm a naturopath, I like dark chocolate, which is obviously the, the healthy kind, but of course it doesn't taste very good. Um, so it's a problem. Someone gave me like 99% chocolate and it tasted like dust. I was like, I can't eat this. This is horrible. <laughs> but it tastes like chocolate covered, like chocolate dust. Like I, I eat the oh. unsweetened baking chocolate and people are like, this is, but I, I like the bitter. I like mm-hmm. the bitter. Yeah. <laughs> no, turns out I like sugar. So I just avoid eating it. <laughs> Please don't give me dark chocolate. (laughs) As it turns out, after much experimentation, it turns out sugar is is something I'm into. Yeah. 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 (laughs) 
It's a fun food, but I have to not eat it because it's a problem otherwise. Yeah. Especially post COVID, I would like to fit into my pants. That's our goal. <laughs> right. Like once, my start, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> like once I have to start wearing pants again, I'd like to fit into them. Now I have to buy new ones. And, yeah. Yeah. My husband had to go to uh, into his office yesterday and he came home and he took his jeans off. And he's like, I had to wear hard pants today. <laughs> <laughs> hard pants. Yeah. Now there's categories like exactly. COVID, we have hard pants and soft pants. Yeah. He's like, I really hope that this isn't a thing when I have to go back all the time, that I have to wear hard pants all the time. People should accept that you're allowed to wear drawstring shorts from now on. For sure. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you know, and leggings. Yeah. I, I bought new leggings and donated a bunch of zipper pants because I'm like, you know what? Never again. Like, who, who, what are we, who are we kidding? Like, <laughs> It's sad. It's going to be like the horse buggy carriage industry went out. It's going to be the zipper industry is gone. The zipper industry, yeah. Gone are the zippers. And, you know, I, I think our bacteria will appreciate it. They have more room to expand. Exactly. Know. They're going to be ha happier. Yeah, this is us, us helping the bacteria. So yeah. when they take over the world, hopefully they will like us best. Yeah, it's like, yeah, in 10 years, they're like, actually, it's now 80 trillion gut bacteria because like, they, yes. they had space. They had more, more space to get to. Yeah. Well, it is one of the things that we're seeing. If you compare us to lower socioeconomic status countries, if you compare us to hunter-gatherer tribes um, or the paleofecal samples, again, like the lab techs, whoever the people are who are going out and sampling old stool, um, <laughs> we are finding less diversity and richness of bacteria. So the numbers are not the same. The types are not the same. Um, one of the things we see around mental health that is really interesting is we're actually seeing that there's a lot of brain inflammation that seems to be part of this. So it's not just serotonin that we're talking about all the time. Um, and with individuals from lower socioeconomic status countries, they have been exposed to more bacteria or worms or parasites earlier on. And we think that's part of training the um, immune system and our inflammatory response system so that it's able to turn on and off much more easily. Um, and so what happens when people are older in those areas, we can be, we can have something happen to our body that causes an increased inflammatory response and it goes up and we could have that happen here and it goes up. But then when the issue goes away, it goes back down to zero. And here we go back down a bit. Mm -hmm. So we actually tend to have a net higher level of inflammation in higher socioeconomic status countries compared to other places in the world. Um, and we're not very good at turning off that inflammation, which we generally think about as pain, but also can be related to mental health conditions as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always explain that to patients. Like, you don't really have pain receptors in your brain tissue. Right. So it just manifests as brain fog or depression or schizophrenia or, or mania or, or mental health conditions, you know, so mood issues or behavioral issues. And so, and I know there's, there's studies where they inject lipopolysaccharide, which comes from some <laughs> of our unhappy yes. gut bacteria, yes. our unfriendly friends. Yep. And acts as a toxin. And acts as a toxin into, into rats or maybe even humans. They might even do this experiment with human beings. Hmm. I'm not sure. Wouldn't yeah. be putting myself up for that one. Uh, but... Yeah. I'm not so, yeah. It doesn't matter how much I get paid for that. <laughs> All right. Like how many soft pants I can wear to those studies. When exactly. Show up for work. <laughs> yeah. But um, it would induce um, depression reliably mm -hmm. in in whatever animal whether it be human or, or rat that is being injected uh with that and then they give them fish oil and bring the inflammation down but we know that the cause is often a, a dysbiosis yes yeah yeah and it's i think that's what we're seeing in some cases is that sometimes we thought things were doing one thing but there may be mm -hmm. actually doing other things mm -hmm. sort of indirectly um so different herbs might be changing the bacterial balance, not just killing things off. And that could be lowering inflammation and that could be setting the, the stage for change. So mm -hmm. fish oils can be helping lower inflammation in some cases. It may not be just that those omega-3s are part of the membrane of um, the cells in the, in the nervous system. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of these areas that I think are very fluid in our understanding of how things are working. Mm, it's so interesting. Yeah. Hmm. When you talk about, so you're mentioning oats and, and, <laughs> and so this is the, the prebiotics are the soluble fibers. Is that, those are the types of fibers in the oats? 
Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Okay. There's other ones that are there, but yeah, okay. it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a bunch of different ones that are out there. It's not quite as specific as that, but yeah. Um, some of the other foods that we would think about onions, garlic, um, almost all vegetables, quite honestly. Um, a lot of our beans will have this, um, mm. bananas, bananas are another good one for that, especially if they're riper bananas. Mm. Um, also a disgusting food. Um, really? but, uh, <gasps> I know. <laughs> I've been watching this dating show for individuals on the spectrum, um, on the autism spectrum, and it's actually been a really great show to watch. Um, that if you need dating advice, it's actually very, very good for that. That's just for general. What's it called? What's it? What is it? I think it's called Dating on the Spectrum. Oh, it's a okay. new Netflix show. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyways, it's quite fascinating. But they come out and they they say things that they like and dislike. And it will often be, I like the sound of bubble wrap popping. Like it's very, very specific things. And yeah. there was a guy who said, I dislike bananas. And it was so <laughs> validating to me because it, it is something that almost nobody agrees with me on disliking bananas. And I know they're super good for you. Mm. Um, but I just cannot, it's, he'll get like somebody will make some sort of, healthy loaf thing with <laughs> almond flour and zucchini and whatever and um like, did no, you put banana in it right. exactly i'm like did you put banana and they're like yeah but it's only half a banana you won't taste it i'm like yes i will it's gross <laughs> my body will say there's no sugar in this it's banana sugar and exactly it's yeah <laughs> but yeah so bananas are actually a really great one um mm -hmm. we also look at our probiotic foods so those are the ones that are our fermented foods so yogurt and not fruit in the bottom um filled mm -hmm. with sugar or artificial sugars which doesn't mm -hmm. make it any better and zero mm -hmm. fat like real real yogurt um mm -hmm. so that um kimchi sauerkraut miso um basically every culture has fermented food in it because it's a way when we didn't have refrigeration to have foods last longer um but we actually see that they can have a net benefit on overall health um so they tend to again confer that health benefit whether they're changing the balance of bacteria whether they're helping produce other metabolites um we see that even with things like sourdough bread um mm -hmm. I definitely think if I was going to be choosing what I think is the best bread that's out there, 100% sourdough is the answer. Mm -hmm. You can't get it from a grocery store though. Um, right. They're mm -hmm. liars and it's not sourdough bread, so that's not ideal. Um, but we see in the sourdough process, it actually breaks down most of the gluten. Mm -hmm. I am not someone that believes that everyone has a gluten problem necessarily, but it does break down the gluten and make that um, more easy to tolerate for people who may have sensitivities. It's not okay for people with celiac though. Mm -hmm. um, we see it breaks down the fructans. So a lot of people with irritable bowel syndrome will tolerate um, sourdough bread a lot more. Um, and it makes a lot of the nutrients more bioavailable in that long time that the bacteria are acting on the nutrients in the sourdough bread. Mm -hmm. um, it, it can do that for people. Um, they actually had a study on people who had celiac disease. So they were newly diagnosed and they either got regular gluten-free bread or they got gluten-free sourdough bread. And they found that the individuals who got the gluten-free sourdough bread, their gut healed more quickly um, mm -hmm. than the individuals individuals who just had the regular one. Um, so we know that fermented foods can have, um, have these benefits. And then we talk about the idea of um, psychobiotics. Now, these aren't as much food product as much as they are probiotic pills in most cases. And we don't really have a good understanding of what these really are at this point. But instead of conferring just a generalized health benefit, these are conferring a benefit on mental health when we are getting an adequate dose of certain probiotics. Um, and we're seeing there's actually been probably a couple dozen studies right now that over half of them are demonstrating that probiotics can have benefit on mental health. Although I will say clinically, I generally haven't seen that a probiotic alone mm -hmm. is really going to be enough for most people at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but there does seem to be some benefit when we're looking at larger populations in that sense. Yeah, I haven't found that either. But I mean, most people have comorbid gut issues. And so potentially the probiotics can help 
but I think, yeah, one of them's El Helveticus and yep. Is that yeah, the big, there's the big player? Or there's you know one. what the problem that I see, and this happened as well with, with looking at some of the studies around um, pregnant women and mm -hmm. sort of conferring the benefit on the mom and the child, they'll have 20 some odd studies and you'll have 20 odd different probiotic pills yeah. that were used, um, which is kind of like saying we had 20 studies on women taking different vitamins and there was benefit, but we but they're all different things. And I think so many people are, are trying to group them together as one thing. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not, they're different organisms that mm -hmm. do different things and make different chemicals. Um, so we can't say that mm -hmm. quite as well, but yeah, that is one of the ones that we see more information about. Yeah. It's also challenging because you do a lot of studies. It doesn't mean that there's a product that's available on the market. Right. Um, so one of the phar the pharmacy that I work with, um, I'll have the pharmacist come and say, you know what, we read this research paper or a patient came in with a research paper about this. Do you know of a product that exists? And I'm like, no, it, there's no product. No. Um, so it can make it really challenging for people who are trying to use the best evidence available. It just doesn't mean that thing easily exists. Mm -hmm. And it, even just how the body receives them as well, like how they're packaged, like that uh, study in cell uh, about the mice. Um, and I think even humans, it was a, it was a few, um, it was almost like a main analysis of different studies about how supplementing with probiotics delayed the recovery back to their original bacterial, bacterial balance after taking antibiotics. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it was, I have to say the conclusion on that study drove me crazy okay. um, because, Good, I'm glad. because what they did was they used healthy individuals. So I think they were like 21 year old healthy men um, and gave them antibiotics and then either gave them nothing or they gave them a probiotic or they gave them um, their own bacteria back. Yeah. Um, like poop, uh, like poop, yes. poop. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, and there is bias in the study and I, I do like this group, but I realize they're commercial as well. So um, it starts with a W. I can't remember the name of the group. Weinstein. Anyways, they're out of Israel. They're, they're very well known, um, but they are a group that is trying to work with um, using people's own microbiota. Um, so there's a little bit of a bias there. And I think there were seven people per group. So it was a very small study. Um, but what they found was these healthy individuals who got their own bacteria back went back to normal most quickly. And that seems to be a fairly self-explanatory idea. Mm -hmm. The people who didn't take anything moved back to what they did previously second fastest. And the people who were given something that was completely different than what their own gut is went back most slowly. Um, and again, that's fairly expected because it's, it's different than what it was. It doesn't mean it was good or bad in any way. Um, it just means they didn't go back to normal as quickly. Right. The problem with the study is most people who are coming in for gut issues or brain issues or pain and inflammation and immunomodulatory issues like autoimmune diseases, their gut microbiota is a problem to begin with. Right. So we're not looking to go back to where it was in the first place. We want it to be better. Right. Um, so if our goal is to go back to that, using your own stuff is not helpful after an antibiotic because it was crappy to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, waiting it out to take you back is not going to be helpful. We want to do something to modulate. Mm -hmm. And we do know that taking probiotics... Um, we used to use the idea that we were repopulating. So if I give you L plantarum 299V, then all of a sudden you're going to have this garden full of L plantarum 299V. And what we know now, if we radio tag them and you stop taking them a week later, you're not going to find them. They're gone. Um, so the way that I think about probiotics is they're more like tourists. They're not immigrants. But while they're there, the same way with tourists, tourists are going to affect the environment. So they could competitively inhibit some of the bad bacteria. They can eat the stuff that you're eating. Just saw a squirrel go past. Um, <laughs> there he is. Oh, it's a chipmunk. He's sitting. Right, he's looking in my window right now. Oh. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, things about working at home. Um, <laughs> but they, um, they can make the chemicals that they make. So if you're eating the oats and the apples and the onions and stuff like that, and their job is to make butyrate, they can then make butyrate and be anti-inflammatory or help with transit time or do those things, but they're only going to help while they're there. So that's another thing that came out of that study sort of group mm -hmm. was that probiotics only help while you're taking them. We've actually known that for quite a while at this point, but um, it was reported rather sensationally at that time. Right. Well, they were, yeah, there, there was also some, I was at a conference and somebody cited a paper, which I could not find where I think it, it was an accidental finding where they had, they had adults and children and the children responded better to the probiotics. Oh. Eventually it lasted, the effects lasted longer, maybe post um, taking the probiotics. And the difference between the two groups was that they were, they had the kids open up the capsule into applesauce. Oh. And so they were actually, the oral mucosa was interacting with the with the probiotics and they're like well the gut starts in the mouth and so the yeah well and i do think about it because i don't think we know whether it's better to take probiotics with or without food like mm -hmm. we've seen mm -hmm. different studies and different information and quite honestly i don't care that much um <laughs> my rule of thumb is if you can get it in your body if you will just take things on a regular basis we have a win yeah, um like but you take it with food or like what's yes exactly because if you're not going to take it with food i'm going to recommend you take it without food yeah. um, whatever is going to work here is most things we can get away with that but when i look at it from a logical perspective and this tends to be I love reading research, but I need to also look at things from a very logical perspective. We didn't ever in the past take probiotic pills. Mm. We had fermented food, so it came with our food. Um, and, and that's something that I think it can, but we can get the buffering effect from lowering the pH when we have it with food a little bit more, um, so more stuff can get through. We still don't even know um, we think that there's some benefit, even if the bacteria aren't alive, like there's certain things we don't know, but, um, but yeah, I, I do think we need to be looking at mm -hmm. some of these bigger picture things and always trying to just completely narrow things down. And really other than my Laura Ingalls theory on how we should eat, um, my other thing is to look at blue zones, um, those areas in the world where people live the longest and in the best health. If we look at the Okinawa area, they're focused on rice, sweet potatoes. Um, they have not a lot of animal product, but it's pork is one of the main ones that they have and soy, which is not an animal product, but that's the other food that they have mm. right there off the bat. They are something like 85% carbohydrate, which is exactly opposite to what we're hearing right now. Mm. They eat soy, which is exactly opposite to what we hear we're supposed to do in some cases. And they're eating pork, which red is meat. a red meat, mm. which is really one of the ones where people are freaked out. Right. And for some of it, good reason, because as much as bacon is yummy, um, the um, cold cuts is the only word that's coming to mind, but those processed meats are, are definitely not good for our bodies. Mm -hmm. If we look at many of the areas, they have beans, well, actually all of the blue zones have beans and legumes as part of their diet on a regular basis. Again, we're seeing a lot of programs that are saying that we shouldn't be having those, whether it's because they have certain chemicals that are purported to be a problem, mm -hmm. or whether it's because of the carbohydrate levels, those are being demonized. Mm -hmm. We have ones that have fermented grains in them. So they have sourdoughs or um, dosas and things that are, are fermented products. Um, again, we often hear grains, we're not ever supposed to have them. Um, in the Mediterranean areas, we see sheep yogurt or fermented sheep milk products being had very, very frequently. Um, so these sort of rules that have been set about things that are the worst um, are actually part of the areas of the world where people are doing the best. So potentially it's about the way that we're doing it. It's our agriculture, it's our microbiota, it's our food processing. Um, this is all interconnected. And I think if we just continue to demonize everything and take away everything, we're gonna keep running into problems because the less we feed our bacteria, um, the more we're going to set up for imbalances, the more we're going to pass that on to our children, which is a problem. Mm -hmm. We see that a lot of the studies that are really high in protein and fat without the balancing 
plant-based foods, we tend to shift more towards Mm -hmm. pro-inflammatory chemicals that are being produced by the bacteria, which can be related to multiple issues, including mental health side of things as well. Mm -hmm. And because there's this rise in, I don't know if you've been following this or have heard of this, the carnivore diet. Oh yes. It hurts. It hurts my heart. (laughs) Like it literally hurts my heart. Um, And I get it. I get why people can actually feel better at the beginning of this. Mm -hmm. If you have a massive dysbiosis that's going on and plant food is feeding that dysbiosis, you will likely feel better not having those foods but the food is not the problem. The bacterial imbalance is the problem. And it tends to entrench people because when they try to go back to having other foods, it makes them feel even worse often than they did previously, but it's not a long-term strategy. Mm -hmm. I personally don't even really think it's a short-term strategy. Um, Like I'm fine, go keto for a little bit with a ton of plants in there, or Mm -hmm. there's things that we can do. I struggle With understanding basic biochemistry and physiology and now the microbiota, it literally hurts my heart to think that people are eating only meat. It's confusing when you're like, how are they still alive? Because even the vitamin C, you're like, how are all your teeth still there? Yeah, it makes me sad. It makes me sad for my microbiota friends. Yeah. Um, Yeah, because I work hard for them. Yeah, it's like all the the tourism industry in the gut is completely shut down at this point, you know? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So when somebody is, you know, someone's dealing with a lot of dysbiosis and so, you know, they, they decide, okay, I'm going to go on the carnivore diet because I read about it on Instagram and I'm going to do it. So then they do that for a couple months and then they start adding foods back in. Mm -hmm. It's likely that the process of reintroducing that's key because often they'll reintroduce something and then, Oh, you know, I had a reaction and Yeah. And while I'm not recommending the carnivore diet Mm -hmm. at all, I do work because I I see so many gut patients and there are issues with food. And again, it's not the food, it's the the microbiota and the gut damage and all of that. But Mm -hmm. the food is a thing in the short term that is causing the symptoms to happen, um, at least indirectly. So there's a lot of the time that we are doing different styles of removing foods from the diet and trying to first of all, see if that makes people feel better because that in itself is a test. It's not a solution, it's a test. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we start to work on the microbiota and then we start, and gut healing, and then we start to bring food back. Um, And we do it in really small amounts to start getting the microbiota used to having those things. So because it's not an allergy or an intolerance, if if someone has an allergy to peanuts and we give them peanut dust, we can send them into anaphylactic shock. If they have a gut microbiota issue and we just sprinkle a little bit of onion powder on something, just a tiny, tiny little bit, um, we're not likely to cause an issue. But if they ate a teaspoon even of onions, that's probably going to cause them problems. Mm -hmm. Um, So we can work and slowly, slowly bring things up to allow for that adjustment to happen as we've been trying to raise the good bacteria levels. Um, But we have to do that work first. Mm -hmm. And is, are you selecting foods based on what you think the diet, the the dysbiosis is, is the science or the way that you're working with it? Is it, you're really understanding the specific strains or the specific things that could be going on? Or is it more like, like a low FODMAP diet to begin with? And then, yeah. And so if we're doing something like that for IBS, we have specific test foods that would be high in something like fructose. We choose something that's at least 65% fructose as a food, and it doesn't have any of the other components in it. Mm -hmm. And we do a slow introduction to see where the body can tolerate. So maybe it can tolerate any level um, Mm -hmm. because really um, within IBS, probably only 25% of people will have a fructose malabsorption issue that's going on. So most people will just be able to bring it back. We still do a slow reintroduction, but there's often no problem that's there. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas we might do another category like the fructans and find that that teaspoon of onions is causing them the next day to have loose stool and bloating. And and we're going to stop at that point. We're still going to work on gut healing and repair and the microbiota. And then we're going to come back to it and we're going to try it at lower levels and start to go more slowly. And as we have more of the foods back, we then start to play around with little bits more throughout the day and starting to combine things together. Um, 
Mm -hmm. to allow for food to come back. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're kind of in each category, you're like, okay, now we're trying fructans. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it may, if, and that depends, I mean, that's if we're doing a low FODMAP diet, if we're doing, if we have to do other styles of programs, there's going to be different ways that we look at it. But yeah, it's usually trying to look at different food categories and having test foods within those categories for people Mm -hmm. and having a slow increase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love the idea of it. it's not a food, right? The, the food is eliciting symptoms because of the bacteria and what they're eating. So right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, it's, it's such a different way of looking at it as well, because I think we've gone so far down the path that the way to health is to continue to limit and limit and limit your diet. So I've taken out dairy and that helps me for a little bit, but now my symptoms are back. So now I'm going to take out wheat and then it goes to gluten. And then you read something and you decide that you have to take out all the histamine based foods. And then you have to take out all the beet. Like, and so it keeps going like that. And then you do a food test and it says you have a problem with eggs as well. And then you heard that it's better to be vegan. And I literally get people who have this insanely weird list of food that they believe that they're able to eat, but the problem is they still don't feel good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they keep taking away more and more things with the idea that eventually if they take away enough stuff, they're going to be healthy. Yeah. For me, having a very small list of foods that you're able to eat. And if you eat other things that are off that list and you are not feeling good, that is the opposite of health. Mm -hmm. Um, I am not, I do not believe health means that you can't eat most foods. Mm-hmm. Right. It's like saying I'm super healthy, but I can only exist at 25 degrees Celsius uh, room temperature. Like I- <laughs> That's exactly it. Yes. <laughs> Which sometimes I feel, but yeah. <laughs> like if it goes up to 30, that I, I just- Exactly. Compare. Yeah. Yeah. And it, but it is, it's a massive problem if you can't eat food. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's a, it's a massive problem just from what's happening from a biochemical and, and physiological point of view, but it's also psychological as well. Mm-hmm. If you're that person who can't eat at the work event, or you're that person who has to give a crazy list to your mother-in-law, um, and they try to make something for you, and then you find out that the steak sauce has stuff in there that you can't have, mm-hmm. and you have to decide between being that person who has the conversation or being that person at the restaurant who's like, okay, no, can you talk to the chef about this now? And all your friends are sitting there going, seriously, I just want to eat. Like, yeah, it's very hard with that. It's very hard to be afraid to go out um, and eat where you are not a hundred percent in control of your food. Yeah, That's something that I think just on that anxiety side of things and stress side of things is horrible. And I get people crying in my office or now in their living room on their virtual appointments um, all the time because that part of things is awful. And I do not think that's healthy. I don't think planning to live your life like that is healthy. So if there's any ways to get food back, and I will say for that peanut allergy or that celiac disease, I don't have any good strategies there. Mm -hmm. Um, But otherwise we're trying to get foods back for you. Mm -hmm. I really don't care if people want to eat soy. I don't care if you want to eat eggs, but we want to know that if you went out and you had an egg and you're not allergic to it per se, that it's not going to cause you to have socially inappropriate gas or be doubled over in pain or um, have brain fog or whatever it is that's happening to you because you had it. Mm -hmm. Again, that's not a great scenario to be in. And yeah, and it doesn't have to be a choice between knowing where all the bathrooms are in a restaurant or having to yeah. Micromanage the waiter to, okay, can you read back to me what I said to you? About exactly. You yeah. Can you bring the chef out here so we can discuss yeah. that you understand that there can't be onion on this? Yeah. Like it's just, it's, it's so difficult. So mm-hmm. yeah, I think there's really big aspects to all of it. And that psychological stress point of it, um, I think is underestimated in in that and we see they've actually started to do some studies on that side of things which i'm very happy about but navigating family feeling the guilt um that can be associated with it it's very very difficult for the individual and if there weren't those other um 
basic um, understandings that we have about health, that there are physiological changes that are causing in part the stress and anxiety responses and, and things like that, um, that in itself is extremely stressful and anxiety provoking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's def- difficult because I think some, you know, in the grander scheme of things in the conventional system, a lot of practitioners like psychiatrists have, have given me feedback on how um, they see the other side where they see someone with anxiety who's extremely anxious about having been prescribed a diet that supposedly Mm. will help with their anxiety. And then, so their response is to just say, well, to heck with it. Just don't even like, this is actually harmful. You shouldn't be focusing on food at all because it's causing distress. But then we miss this whole piece where we can actually be influencing someone's health by by, by um, encouraging them to eat a well-balanced diet, support their microbiome, and not necessarily focus on just the restriction, yes, which is causing distress, you know? Absolutely. And I think that's hard because I think part of mental health can be that fear of a lot of things. So even though someone's not feeling good, eating the very limited, not crappy in the sense of nutrients, but just crappy in the sense of life experience diet that someone's eating bringing something back is terrifying. Mm. Um, It's actually kind of funny. And we have a ton of resources for patients to be able to make changes really well. We want people to not feel overwhelmed if we are asking someone to take something away for a period of a couple weeks or something. Um, But it's something that I'm actually fairly convincing. So I find I can convince people to take foods away And I think that's kind of what people have been primed with, with what we see in social media or seeing different healthcare providers or watching Dr. Oz or whatever it is, we're kind of primed for that already. It can be more challenging and more fear inducing for people to bring something back. Um, I get a lot of people are saying, but I'm feeling great. Are you sure I have to try that food? And yeah, yeah, you do. Um, Yeah. Non-negotiable. Yeah. Um, we can negotiate on the timing of that, but mm-hmm. eventually you have to bring this stuff like back. After your cousin's wedding, maybe. You know? Exactly. Yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. We can negotiate that and we can, we don't have to pick something that you don't want if you don't like it, or if you want to do this first and that last, I don't care about that. Mm-hmm. Um, but eventually we have to try some of these foods. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We've been primed by dieting culture, right? So now it's like, mm-hmm. well, if you were restricting in order to look a certain way now, you restrict in order to deal with a health condition, you know, and yes. there's a little bit of a moral thing around it. Like patients will feel shame if they haven't followed advice or, you know, what they're understanding what I'm, um, my communication, they're understanding that I'm telling them to remove something forever, that this is this evil food. If you yes. look at it, there's some sort of moral failing within you or some sort of willpower deficiency. So there's a lot of, just exactly what you said, like people are primed to be told maybe by their ND that they're going to have something removed. So they're like, okay, I'm ready for this. or I'm expecting this. So this is what I thought would happen. Great. You're taking my pizza. Okay. I think I can do it. Um, Yeah. Well, I always find it funny because I think my patients like me because I'm honest when I fail at diet. Um, Because as much as I actually love vegetables, I hated vegetables for the longest time. I actually hated a lot of food. I'm pretty sure um, until yeah. <laughs> part way through going to school to become a naturopath, I lived off of variations of bread and cheese and chocolate, uh, which again, wasn't really chocolate, it's just sugar. Um, <laughs> so this was a huge process for me to get to the point that I eat a wide variety of food in general, um, and especially vegetables and I hated all it. Like I hated all the food. Um, all real food was not yummy to me. Um, but even though I actually love vegetables, there is nothing that makes me happier to look at a plate full of food that has a variety of color and flavors. And um, it just, it makes my heart sing when I see that. But tonight, to be honest, I am going into a drive-in movie and I am going to be eating crap food. Um, (laughs) And that is just going to happen. And I'm going to feel okay about that. Um, And I think I think it's important. I don't think it's important to eat crap food, Um, but I think it's important that we understand that most of us are not going to be perfect um, and that we have choices that we're going to make. And I think it's better for me to make a deliberate choice to eat not great food 
even though I made an amazing lunch and will have an amazing dinner and will work out before going to this because that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And then I've made a deliberate choice that I'm going to eat some non-healthy food and realize that it's not great for my body. It's not going to help my body become stronger, but I'm making a conscious choice that I'm going to do it anyways, and I'm not going to feel bad about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like, you know, I mostly watch documentaries and every now and then I watch a really cheesy romantic comedy and <laughs> yes, and it's, it's, yeah, it's like a Twinkie for the soul. You're like, it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're going to do this sort of stuff and that's okay. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's like every now and then you scroll through Instagram. You're not always productive yet. Every now and then I have fries. <laughs> like, it's, it's all good. <laughs> well, and I think it's the bigger picture. And even when I look at the blue zones and how we relate them to what is happening with the microbiota and overall health and mental health, it's not just about food. And I think, and I've, I mean, I've focused on that a huge amount today because I do think it's really important, but it's also our sleep, which is a massive part of not only mental health and stress management, but what happens to the microbiota, our sense of community, um, our sense of purpose in the world, our movement. It's, it's all of these things together. So if I choose to eat something that is not amazing, I'm also expecting that my other habits are generally going to be okay enough to get me through that poor choice. Mm -hmm. The same way in Laura Ingalls' times, there were times where things went out of control in a certain area, um, mm -hmm. but there were other areas that were supporting her. Um, so I do focus, and I think it's really important for the microbiota to have very regular sleep um, and to not be shifting our time um, that circadian rhythm. Mm. We see that's a really big deal with our microbiota. So I will still, I check the time on this movie and it happens to be the princess bride. So it's only an hour and a half. So I will still be able to get home for my regular bedtime so that I know that my melatonin levels will be appropriate for my sleep, for my healing and repair, also for affecting that intestinal permeability and my gut microbiota. So there's other things that can balance everything out. Yeah, I, I always talk about circadian rhythms. It's like a big obsession of mine. And yeah, because <laughs> I think it really garners, like, how does that specifically affect the microbiome? What have you read? or what Well, you... and it's really interesting because it's not possible for the microbiota to have its own circadian rhythm because it lives in the dark. It's not, it doesn't have a sleep wake cycle, um, <laughs> which is, is really interesting, mm -hmm. but it follows our pattern. So we actually see that bacteria levels can oscillate with our circadian rhythm. And generally at certain times of day, we have certain bacteria levels that are, are circulating up a little bit and they're producing more chemicals. So if we are supposed to have more healing and repair chemicals that are being at, made at night when we go to sleep, but we're shifting our sleep patterns and those are happening at different time periods, um, which we're seeing, we, I mean, we see it a lot with shift workers and pilots and um, hospital staff. It comes up very, very commonly. I, I see a lot of my nurses that come in. That's a really, really big issue. Um, but I'm actually seeing it probably more in people playing video games and watching Netflix late at night and believing that they can't sleep. That's affecting the the balance of the gut microbiota, it's affecting when certain metabolites are being produced. Mm. So it's happening at the wrong time. Um, and we're seeing that that's affecting our intestinal permeability as well. And then that in turn affects our sleep um, mm -hmm. and sort of that bi-directional um, mm -hmm. effect that we see. And even yeah, simple things like glucose control and insulin. Mm -hmm. It's massive with that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we start to do things at those times that we shouldn't be doing. So eating in the middle of the night. Um, that's not when our, our bacteria are supposed to be fermenting and metabolizing things. So they're going to be making chemicals at that point that are not appropriate. Um, mm -hmm. So sleep is a really interesting piece on things because we look at historically um, 
we, we might have famines, we would run out of food, um, but we had ways to store energy so that we could use it in those times, which is why it's so easy to gain weight right now, because we never have times where we run out of food. We are always in abundance, but we had this backup system for that. Um, we don't have a backup system for sleep. Um, there's no sleep bank that actually exists. It is required that we sleep. And that's a really weird thing when we look at it through evolution that the things that could harm us, like, I don't know if saber tooth tigers and humans existed at the same time, but if they did, a saber tooth tiger, I have no idea either. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Or another tribe that could harm us or whatever it is that we need to fall asleep in the middle of the night where we are perfectly helpless Mm -hmm. to all of those things yet it's a requirement and there's no way to bank it. So it is obviously something that is inherently important to us as human beings. There is no getting around it. And in the last decades, it has become something that is, is not, it's not, not only prioritized, it's something that it's often a badge of honor Mm -hmm. to talk about how little we sleep. Mm -hmm. It's like this sense of bravado of like, I only got two hours or I never sleep. I, you know, right. Yeah. I only need five hours sleep. Mm -hmm. That's not true. Mm -hmm. That is not true. You are wrong. Um, Even for people who are those super sleepers who need less sleep than the average person, it's not very much less than the average person Mm -hmm. requires. And it's not only how much sleep we need. It's the quality of sleep that we're getting. And it's when we're getting it. We have been programmed to get sleep at certain times of day when certain um, physiological things happen in our body. And that is related heavily to the microbiota. And we see if that's not happening, um, we can have our, the way that our body is influenced by stress to go off, which makes us more vulnerable to stress-related diseases at that point. And that's related to the sleep, that's related to the microbiota, that's related to those circadian rhythms. It's really such an important part of our health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. When I think of anxiety, I always think of this was a mechanism that we evolved to have to be anxious, to defend against danger. Right. Yes. What's the best way to communicate with your body that it's safe and that it doesn't need to feel anxiety is to like, you know, what would be the signals of safety and and abundance and living in, in, you know, the land of plenty would be that you're sleeping appropriately, that Mm -hmm. you're you're eating regularly and at the right times and an abundance of nutrients. So these are, these are safety signals that are super important for helping calm the nervous system. Yeah. Yeah. And instead we're doing the opposite a lot of the time, even though we actually, for most of us, not all of us, but most of us live in a time of luxury that we could do these things, but we also live in a time of luxury that we don't have to. Right. Um, and again, Laura Ingalls didn't have electricity from what I think in pioneer times. I re- think there were lanterns um, and fires. So it's very inconvenient to do things at two in the morning. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't be playing video games and reading a book or doing a puzzle. The only thing you have to do is sleep. Um, mm-hmm. So now we have this luxury to not sleep, yet it's actually something that's hugely detrimental And I hear, I mean, I hear from moms all the time that, you know what, it's the only time that I get to myself Mm -hmm. and I just want that time because it makes me feel better, except then they're expressing that they have IBS and they're tired and they have sugar cravings and they're low mood and, and all of these things are happening, um, and it's, so it's always these trade-offs that are happening, but we often can't recognize that sometimes the signals that our body are telling us like sugar cravings or like, I have to have a snack at nine 30 at night, even though I ate my dinner at seven o'clock and you're actually not starving. I can promise you you're not <laughs> starving. These signals that our body are, are telling us some of the time are just not true. And that's really hard because sometimes they are very strong. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's funny because tonight I know that I will eat non-healthy food. I'm actually not craving it. Mm -hmm. Um, I find that's a better scenario to make a deliberate choice for me than to do it when my body is telling me that I need to eat Mm -hmm. Um, Mm M&Ms. Because that is an 
it's a wrong signal and it's likely going to spiral me because I'm feeding into imbalances that are, are telling me these wrong signals. But it's hard to believe that when our brain is so acutely telling us something or that the world is dangerous or driving is dangerous or being in a crowd is dangerous, that maybe those aren't true things. It's mm. very hard to believe that. It's a good point. And I find actually with cravings, my hypothesis is that about 90%, 99 is it, cravings are actually really just hunger. And it's, it's just people have been in a calorie deficit, usually earlier on in the day, haven't eaten enough, and they're waiting for the big meal, which is dinner, but they're usually having cravings at 4 p.m. Yeah. Or and then you just eat until food. bedtime at exactly. that point. Like you're right. just, it's so, so much of that. But again, and we have some great studies on this, we can see that the microbiota being imbalanced can tell us mm. that we're, we're having these cravings mm. um, so that we're having sugar cravings that are happening. And often when we stop feeding that imbalance, we see that all of a sudden it stops. Mm -hmm. And That's I'll get that. Yeah. I've done that myself. Like I can see that, but I can see this with a lot of patients as well. And I'm like, please, like I get the idea of moderation and it sounds really, really lovely, but sometimes we have to do a trial where it's not moderation. Like mm. even just try it for a week and see what happens. And they're like, oh, it went away. Um, mm. And you're like, yeah, it's magic. But it's, it is something that we can see that these signals are not true all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need t-shirts that say, it's not me, it's my gut bacteria. <laughs> we do. That would be fantastic. <laughs> like, we get into like a, yeah, a traffic issue. You're like, or, uh, <laughs> just like, sorry, gut bacteria made me cut you I off. Fe I feel like the, the, um, the number of people buying the t-shirts might be really low, but I feel like my friends would find it funny, which is great. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'll just draw it on a t-shirt myself. <laughs> You're like, it's just really just one person wants to buy it. Exactly. It's me. I'll make it. Yeah. Crayons. Like, did you know that there's 40 trillion gut bacteria that are more than our human cells? You can tell them I, all that at that point. I should just wear t-shirts with bacteria facts on them all the time <laughs> so that people are warned when they talk to me that this is going to come up. It'll, yeah, that glazed those, moment. Really, yeah, it's like, it's like, oh, have you seen that soccer game? You know, <laughs> you're like, you know, they're gut bacteria, and then you exactly. could segue really quickly. Like, I love it. I love it. Yeah, and I have actually just one. So, about gut testing. So, you know, yeah. a lot of us practitioners, um, there's a variety of different gut tests that people will order from small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, like SIBO testing, breath yep. testing, like stool culture to things like Viome, the RNA. Uh, um, yes. Analysis. And, and what do you think about that? Do you use any of those in your practice or? Yeah. So I use some of them. It's not always a go-to for me. And I think people are surprised about that a lot of the time. Um, I've found that there's a lot that can be done without having to go to expensive testing all the time necessarily. Mm -hmm. That being said, I get a lot of people who have complicated situations. So we are, and they've tried a lot of the sort of standard medical system stuff. They've tried a lot of the alternative stuff. So we've seen those changes um, happen. And then we look at testing options. Um, there's good and bad to the testing. So SIBO is our small intestinal bowel overgrowth. Um, so instead of just talking about a dysbiosis or an imbalance between the good and bad bacteria, we have way too many bacteria that are living in the small intestine. And that's a really long tube. It's about the height of a giraffe, um, but it's really skinny. So if you have this really skinny long tube and you have way too many bacteria living in there and they're producing, because they're all producing gases and chemicals, then all of a sudden that messes up the balance on things. Mm -hmm. So we can find that that, um, that imbalance, the sort of gold standard of testing is not the breath test, which is available to patients generally. <laughs> Excuse me. Bless you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so but most people aren't able to have the bacteria actually measured. So that's not going to happen. So breath testing is the surrogate measure of what we're looking at. So what happens is they provide um, food for the bacteria. So there's a couple different things that can be used that the bacteria would eat, and then they measure how much gas would be produced. So we know if you have sort of a normal amount of bacteria, you might produce this much gas. And if you have SIBO and you have way too many bacteria, you might produce this much gas. Unfortunately, there's really good and bad with the testing. So with 
both types, types of testing, we can get false positives or false negatives. False negatives meaning um, you do have it and um, it says that you don't and false positives meaning it says you have it and you actually don't. Um, so we can run into problems with that. So it is something that I'm really selective when I do the testing um, to make sure that we've tried the other stuff first, um, ruling in or out a bunch of other stuff, making sure that they're hitting on the major criteria for small intestinal bowel overgrowth. And I think sometimes people will look and say, oh, I have a rash and I occasionally get bloated and those two things are on the list, therefore I have SIBO. That's not the way that I look at it. We really want to see a big picture of this that is not solvable by regular means that often don't involve testing. Um, and then I would consider looking at it. And most commonly, I would be recommending doing both um, the glucose and the lactulose because that kind of balances out some of the false positive, false negative side. Unfortunately, that makes it much more expensive if we're doing the double test at that point. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I do see that being used. Stool testing, um, one of the tests that I use most commonly is fecal calprotectin. Um, so that's something that um, it's not covered by OHIP here from what I understand. So people are paying out of pocket one way or the other for that test, but it's a gut inflammatory marker. And that's really important between differentiating between something like, is it an IBS or is it a SIBO? Or is it something that has a frank high level of inflammation? So that could be a Crohn's or colitis, a really severe diverticular disease where you have those outpouchings in the large colon, it can cause an infection and inflammation and pain, um, and it can end up with people needing surgery. Bad infections like C. difficile, we can see that. So if we have someone who says has a flare of Crohn's or colitis, um, and usually in these scenarios, um, they might not be able to get in to have a colonoscopy in a timely manner. And we're trying to figure out, is this just really super bad IBS or is this um, Crohn's or colitis? We would see the fecal calprotectin elevated 99% of the time in Crohn's or colitis, a very, very mild inflammation in about 15% of the cases of IBS. So that can be a clear differentiator on what direction we want to go while we're waiting for someone to get tested. Or it's also a good measure of whether people um, who say have Crohn's or colitis if we're actually seeing that their inflammation is going down because symptoms aren't always perfect with that. Um, so it can be a measure of are things going down without needing to get a colonoscopy all the time, which is invasive and they can't just get you in for a colonoscopy all the time because that's really, really awkward. Right, right. Um, yeah, unpleasant for many reasons. Um, so I like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but more of what we hear about are the comprehensive digestive stool analysis that are looking at a lot of different markers. So it's looking at inflammation. It's looking at, do you have an H. pylori infection? It's looking at immune markers that are there. It's looking at, are you digesting meats properly and fats properly and mm -hmm. all of these markers. And then it's starting to look at the bacterial balance. So in the past, it was looking at these culturing techniques. Um, so what what good and bad bacteria can we find that we can culture? And now they're using more of these molecular techniques that can look at these obligate anaerobes that we can't study through any other method. Um, and again, there's really good and bad. So if we found an infection or found that someone had a parasite or ova or yeast, that can be really helpful for us. Um, and then we're into a middle ground on things. So now it will tell us that you have a raised level of something like acromantia or a lowered level or F. prosnitzi or all these ones that we, we have some information about, but we don't have as much information as we would hope. So it can give us a broad picture of whether we're seeing more of an inflammatory side of things, not with it necessarily being an inflammatory condition like Crohn's or colitis, but just are we seeing generalized more inflammatory markers that are being produced? Um, or are we lacking some of the good bacteria that's there? But sometimes what will happen is we'll get, it will say something like this bacteria is elevated. Um, and if it's elevated, that can be related to metabolic syndrome, weight gain, um, diabetes. And if it's too low, it's related to autoimmune conditions. And you're like, so what do I do with that fact? Um, 
because first of all, what do you do with that fact? Um, so the goal is to get it like Goldilocks where you get it like right in the middle so that it's going to be perfect. But the question is, how do we do that? Um, so because if we go to kill it, we're going, first of all, we don't necessarily in most of these cases know what will specifically kill these very specific bacteria. Um, and if we kill that specific bacteria, we are likely to kill a bunch of other stuff as well, because it's not that we have sort of laser beam targeted, I can kill this one kind of thing. Um, to pull in, like, you know, even right. the area and of the body where it's located. Absolutely. And we've talked about the idea that with probiotics, if we say that this good bacteria is low, we can't just give you a pill of that. And then all of a sudden that one thing just goes up. So we instead have to take it more as a broad picture of we're leaning in this direction. And then this is what we want to do to try and raise good bacteria and hopefully competitively inhibit. And we're seeing that, um, there's a problem with the enzyme levels, so we can do this associated with it. Um, but it's not, it's not quite as clear cut as we hope. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it is something that I use and, and I've, I've definitely found that there can be benefit in using it. But I think if people don't have to spend hundreds of dollars, just as an upfront, I'm trying to deal with my IBS and anxiety, that's great. If it's something that you've taken out all of the foods and all of the lands and you feel horrible and you've tried supplements and medications and you meditate and you've like done the things and you're so tired and frustrated and you've probably spent way more than hundreds of dollars on the things that you're trying that's where targeted testing becomes more important and I think can be very, very valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's a, maybe one of the differences between NDs and like sort of the functional medicine approach, which is just to test $5,000 of testing, come back and see me, and then we'll take a history, you know, whereas right. we usually rely on, on clinical experience, right? Like you have so much experience yeah. that it's helping you inform decision-making with your patients uh, without the need for testing necessarily. Yeah. And I'm very clear around testing that my goal is not to do a fishing expedition. Um, and I want to be able to do things that are, are going to have meaningful outcomes that we can do something to change something. Um, because I have seen those scenarios and I mean, it can happen with naturopaths as well, but, um, but these scenarios where people will get all these will do the hormone test and we'll do the nutrient test and we'll do the gut microbiota test and we'll do the fatty acid test. And so they've got all these tests and it comes back saying, well, you should be taking a probiotic and you should take vitamin C at 410 milligrams. And they're like, I'm already taking this stuff. Like I'm taking five grams. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's challenging with that, I think. And that can be really, really frustrating. And that's, I see this a lot and I think sometimes people are not sure how to handle it, but I'll get people who have taken away all of the foods and are taking literally a dozen to two dozen supplements and they've got medications and they've got these test results that have not yielded something that's necessarily beneficial. And we don't know what's interacting with each other because there's definitely no study on 16 supplements and five mental health medications. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And we're just kind of at this point that I'm saying we've got to back off on these supplements and we've got to start bringing foods back. Um, and yeah, let's look at all of this again in a really comprehensive way, but just throwing the kitchen sink at things doesn't mm -hmm. often make things better either. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, I, I, I experimented with, um, some gut testing on myself and, and they give food recommendations. And one of them was your superfood is dark turkey meat. And then the explanation for why was because it contains protein. <laughs> yeah. I was like, yes. well, <laughs> yeah. And yeah. definitely um, to be clear, the science on the microbiota being able to tell us what we need to eat mm -hmm. is too early. It's too mm -hmm. early to make these claims. Mm -hmm. The other challenge with that is unlike my own human DNA, which is basically the same, certainly there's changes within epigenetics and how things are expressing, but within the microbiota, if I take an antibiotic today, but I tested my microbiota yesterday, 
Mm. It, the results are not going to be reflective of what just happened. If we know that they did a study where they had people eating a regular omnivore animal food, plant food diet, and then put half the group onto a fully basically carnivore diet, so no plant food at, versus a vegan diet, they had statistically significant changes in the microbiota within three days. Mm -hmm. um, so we can change that microbiota so easily. So what does that mean if we send it back? Right. And it now says that your superfood is chia seed um, because it has chia in it. I don't know. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> she is magic. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it, we're definitely, the science is not there. And for most of those sorts of things, if you read the terms and conditions on that, it has a very, very clear statement that this is um, entertainment in nature. It is not diagnostic of anything and it does not um, supplant getting medical advice for your health conditions. Mm. Um, Mm -hmm. which whenever it puts in there that this is for entertainment value when it's a medical test, um, I find that very confusing to people, especially because most people don't read the terms and conditions on these things. Right. Um, yeah. 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 It's like you could go to an arcade or you could send your poop in to a lab. <laughs> <you know? laughs> they can tell you to eat dark turkey meat as your superfood. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's very That's interesting. I mean, like we do want an answer, right? This is the, this is the thing. Medicine is an applied science. And so we want to know how, how do I, what do I do with this? How do I yeah. use this information? So you yeah. have these cool studies with mice who are more exploratory because they have the right kind of bacteria, but we just, what does that mean for somebody who's dealing with anxiety? You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, but it's a great area. Um, there's so much more information that's coming out every single day right now. Mm -hmm which is so exciting. And I, and that's one of the things that I always say with people that even if this is not the thing that's going to help you, just the volume of interest in this area, whether it's with researchers, whether it's with companies, whether it's with healthcare providers and labs, we are just getting more and more information on how to make this more usable and how to figure out what is going to really be helping people at that point. And I think it's so exciting. And the fact that I just kind of, I got an email that dropped me into this area is one of the most amazing things to me because it is just made my life so much better yeah it's so amazing yeah it's very synchronous where you're like maybe it was the gut bacteria that inspired you to answer the exactly yeah. some sort of fermentation product was like i'm gonna open this email it probably was yeah from this random weirdo no <laughs> but it's really interesting right so we all have uh, a vast microbiota and mm -hmm. uh and you know so just understanding how we can care for that based on what evidence we have available like everybody's sort of involved in how do I, you know, the right kind of shampoos for hair care and skin care. And so, you know, thinking along the lines of food in terms of how it can feed the microbiome. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. It's what, it's what I think about every day is what am I doing for them? Mm -hmm. um, and oh. yeah, it, it does. It makes them sad when I don't have enough color and vegetables and, and yeah. things. So yeah, it's one of the things that you can do. Go out, eat some oats, have yeah. some probiotic based foods, um, have the color and variety in there. And if it's not working for you, if those foods are making you feel bad, mm -hmm. there is a reasonable chance that there's something that's off in the microbiota and the gut. And that could be affecting so many other areas of health. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a great, that's a great take home message is then to do some deeper work and maybe work with somebody like you and, and, and deep dive into that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is great, Kim. So where can we find you or any last thoughts? Um, well, definitely, I think that if we're not thinking about our microbiota, we are missing out on half of our health. And mm -hmm. the other take home is that if our strategy to be healthy is to not be able to eat food, I think we're mm -hmm. missing what health mm -hmm. actually is. Um, but I actually, I work out of um, Kitchener-Waterloo, mainly out of my house right now, although I do have a clinic that I barely ever see during COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but that's actually been great. It's opened up a lot of virtual care. So I, I've all of a sudden started seeing people from all over Ontario, which has been wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually really liked that side of things. Um, and then I have my website, drkimbrettsnd.com. Um, the same thing for Instagram and Facebook as well. 
You have a great Instagram feed with very entertaining, informative posts that we'll, we'll <laughs> post links to everything in the show notes so people can find you. Oh, I appreciate that. Thanks so much. <laughs> All right, Kim, thank you so much for joining me. This is great. Really informative. Yeah, it was very fun. Thanks so much. Thank you.